and sometimes they worked very hard over the years meditating and giving Dhamma talks and then somebody actually showed me one of these memory sticks all the hard work all of the meditation instructions, all the Dhamma talks which I ever gave just this tiny little stick and that doesn't represent all the hard work and effort you come into this a tiny little stick So anyway, be very easy. If one day someone develops a portal, just direct into the brain. You just put in your memory stick, and all the talks you've ever heard are just all available direct to your brain. Isn't that be a good idea? <laughs> Virtual reality. You just look at these virtual reality goggles and you're in Bodhgaya and Buddha's teaching you. Would that work? And after a little while, you see these beautiful nimittas, these lights coming. <laughs> it's your virtual reality. <laughs> I don't think that will work. But anyway, here we go. So, this is not virtual reality, this is the real thing. Sitting down, closing your eyes. And to ask yourself, first of all, how are my legs? Can you feel your legs? You can become aware of them. Really get to know them. It's not just so oh, they're crossed or they're hanging over the end of the chair. You can really get to feel them as fully as possible with your mind, including your your feet. You wiggle your toes. You get awareness down there. And are they really in the best position? If they're not, you now have the opportunity to move them to adjust your posture. Try moving. Moving allows you to have feedback. <clears throat> and you learn through that movement whether your comfort has increased or decreased. If it's increased, well done. If it's decreased, go back to where you were before. This is actually caring for your body. Awareness and caring until you can get the best possible position for your own legs. And then you move up to your buttocks. Are they comfortable? If not, fit it. Moving this way, that way, until you can find the greatest degree of comfort. Again, it's not just for the purpose of physical comfort. You're learning how to be aware and kind. How to adjust with wisdom so your body can be at ease. So afterwards your mind can be at ease. Once your buttocks are well adjusted, move up to your back. Stretching the back if you want to get a, a nice hit of endorphins. 
and then relaxing. Move your back to the left or right, backwards or forwards, until you find the optimum position for your own back. you're on a chair, sometimes you need to lean back against the backrest for comfort. Sometimes move forward. You find the most comfortable position for you today. It may not be the same as this afternoon. You feel it. Developing awareness. Getting feedback from that awareness and using kindness to relax your own body. Then you may check your hands. Are they in the best position? Can you move them this way, that way? Does it make them feel better or worse? This is where <coughs> you're exploring and learning. Learning how your body works and how to bring it to comfort and health. Then you can move up the arms to your shoulders. I usually spend a few moments with my shoulders because they can be seats of great tension and tightness. And I imagine my shoulder blades, or those muscles underneath those shoulder blades, I imagine them as bundles of strings which are pulled apart, <coughs> stressed. And I could visualize them as a bundle of strings on either side of the spine which have been pulled apart, stretched. Then imagine them just letting go of both ends. It's a little technique which works for me because as soon as I did that imagination, the real muscles also relax. They're not pulled apart, they're loose at ease. I can feel that. My mindfulness gives me enough feedback. I can feel my shoulder muscles relaxing. And it feels pleasant. Now I move up to my throat, neck. Ask, how are you doing? Next word. When I have awareness, as I said earlier, I'm aware of a slight irritation in my throat, some allergy or whatever. Aware of it, and I've learned how to relax it. So the, the tightness, the itch, a little ache in the centre, and ease it. The feeling gets less and less. Not because I would it to get less, because I just let it be.
once the throat is relaxed, move up to the front of my face because the muscles around the eyes and the mouth they manifest our emotions so easily that people can read your state of mind through the expression on your face. So I get to know the muscles around my eyes and mouth aware of them, mindful of them. I learn how to relax them. Let them go. So those muscles are loose and free. And if you have one part of your body which is still irritating, it could be your stomach or your bowels or your irritable bowel syndrome or some sort of ache or pain or injury somewhere. A useful way is to zoom in on that, like on Google Maps. Until your mind, your awareness is full just of that irritating feeling or pain or ache. And once you have awareness, the most disturbing part of your own body. Then see if you can learn how to relax it all. So let it be. Stop worrying about the future or the past. Just be right now. Be kind. You find you can relax anything. Once the body is relaxed to the max, you may be able to notice what I call the delightful feeling of relaxation. It's a subtle pleasure, an ease, which is not that hard to focus on. Allow your mind to rest in the delight of relaxation. And you may find that that relaxation goes deeper still. The body at ease, relaxed, and pleasant. Then we move up to our mind. Your peaceometer. How peaceful are you now? Or how agitated? Give it the number from 1 to 10. Be honest. There's nothing to hide. Once you have awareness of the peaceometer, what makes your mind more peaceful? What makes it more disturbed? See if you can discover that. You 
usually find memories of the past, fears of the future, this disturb your mind. But being in this moment where you can't want anything, just happy to be here, <coughs> allows the peaceometer to show a more calm and peaceful state. And get to recognize what peace feels like, its causes and what it really is. Once the mind is reasonably peaceful, it happens quite naturally, you can become aware of your breathing. If it doesn't happen naturally, you can always just invite the breath in. Am I breathing in or am I breathing out right now? However you know the breath is good enough. Breathing in peace, can you imagine peace, visualize it, and imagine it riding in on the back of peace into your body and mind, riding out, let go, breathing in peace, breathe out, let go.
is getting close to the end of this meditation session. <coughs> How do you feel? How relaxed is your body? How peaceful is your mind? <coughs> is it strong enough for you delight to delight in that peace? see the happiness of a calm mind. now ring the gong three times. Please listen to every sound from the gong. The end of the third ringing, you may open your eyes. That's the start of this meditation. Just learn how to be peaceful and calm. Relax the body, relax the mind. And when you get on to the breathing, you can actually, you're, you're started well. Even with the Satipatthana Sutta, it always says that you start off if you look at this beginning of the A4 path, you're restraining the hindrances and then you are set making awareness the most important thing. Sometimes when they say to put awareness in front of you, the in front of you is a metaphor first on your list. Put it at the top. Make it a priority. This is where we develop the mindfulness first of all. And then when the mindfulness is strong enough, then we can start watching the breath without any problems. However, if the mindfulness is, is not strong enough because the, what we call the hindrances haven't been really dealt with, still wanting a lot, still tired, still restless, still negative, and of course it's almost impossible to watch the breath except with force and then after a while it just all wears out. One of the reasons why when already mentioned uh, Philip Golding's research. People try so hard and they better go into a spa. They get more relaxed. But also, just uh, uh, remember <coughs> that you know, sometimes without that initial uh, calming a person down, they try to meditate and they just get frustrated. So by starting off very slowly, very gently, the very least, we can start to become very aware of our body and how it works. We do not want for results. And that's one of the reasons why we start this meditation and just amazing just how many positive results people have got from this path of meditation, which surprises me. We're just talking about physical results. I was just telling some people uh, a few days ago over in Perth about one of those stories, this gentleman who, uh, well, I was giving a retreat at Wat Buddha Dhamma many years ago, and this gentleman came, he checked in with me first of all, but after the first day, I had all these questions and people said, Ajahn Brahm, could you please ask everybody to breathe quietly? Because <laughs> this gentleman was making a very loud noise, they're really breathing. <gasps> 
And because he checked in with me, I should have told him beforehand, the other meditators, that person has got a big tumor in his sinus. He's got nasal cancer. And his doctors have given up hope. He's come to this retreat just as what they often do, just the last row of the dice. Maybe meditation would work. This was many years ago. And he made a lot of noise because that's the only way he could breathe. Nine days of retreats, nothing happened until always the very last session when people give up trying. Nothing has worked, so oh, I'll just, what the heck. And now they meditate properly <laughs> without trying. Because that's where I was about to get in the car to get the ride back to the airport, to get back to Perth. And this gentleman came running. Ajahn Baba, you've got to stop. I've got to tell you something. What's happened? At the very last meditation, he heard a popping sound. Pop. In his nose, he could breathe. Only for one minute. His tumor suddenly opened up and air could pass through his nose. And it's not imaginary, sort of he heard it and he could breathe properly. But then it closed up again afterwards. And I didn't have any time to talk to him, just said, carry on. And I thought he wouldn't survive. Too late. But he has these wonderful experiences. I wouldn't tell this. I only tell the stories with happy endings. That's my, all the times when it doesn't work, I don't tell you. But for this guy, I was back in Sydney teaching somewhere or other, and the gentleman came up. Of course, he looked totally different. You know, one is, you know, the cancer would be healed. He said, do you remember me? He said, no. And he said, I was that guy. The tumor just shrunk totally. And now I'm in remission. He said, thanks so much. He said, I'm now going to spend the rest of my life, however many years I've got, teaching meditation to others. And it does work. And there's amazing stuff which happens. But only if you do it properly. You try, and you get more tense. You let go. Relax. Even if you're dying, relax. <clears throat> and then you allow amazing stuff to happen. So this is just getting in contact with your body. And the reason I tell those stories is actually to motivate you that this is important stuff. Yeah, getting enlightened, you know, when it gets down to it, yeah, getting deep in it, oh yeah, well, maybe. But your health is really is a priority in today's world. So that really gets you into understanding this body, how to relax it, understanding how to be peaceful. And then, all the time, I focused on this morning, the delight, a peaceful body and a tranquil mind. And of course, well you hear from me later, you probably know from all the other times I've said this, that delight just really goes to unexpected levels. All very powerful minds with great insights. So this is what happens in meditation trying to get people into the relaxation and delight very quickly. So you know, if you don't get into the higher levels of meditation just this much, having a relaxed body, being able to go to sleep at night, having it pretty healthy, simply because you understand your body and you can relax and get your mind tranquil, how you can just overcome anxiety. I get so anxious having to give talks to all you guys day after day. It's obvious, isn't it, how, how anxious I am. <laughs> That's being, being uh, <coughs> satirical. Anyway, so, any questions about the meditation so far? <coughs> yeah. Yes, you can become attached to peace. It's okay, I can. Yeah, you can be attached to peace, and what that does, it means you get enlightened. <coughs> this, I... People have all these ideas, attachments are always bad. I am attached, I'm addicted to drinking water every day. I can't do without it. <laughs> Some addictions are there for a purpose. And also that I often quote 
It's called the Pasadika Sutta in the Diga Nikaya. I can get it out for you afterwards if people don't trust me. It's right in there. And there uh, the Buddha was uh, talking to one of his disciples and said, look, if people say, oh, you monks, they're talking about monks, so you monastics, you just indulge in happiness. And even actually the previous Pope, I mean, he was giving a little book a long time ago, and he was uh, basically putting down all the other religions. And he said, Buddhism, it just teaches auto-eroticism. And that's how he put it. But, you know, at least he had a little bit of a point. And they're just, you know, just the, the bliss, the ecstasies of meditation. At least he you know, got a little way to understanding what Buddhism was. But, you know, we're always saying, oh, that's bad for you. But in the Pasadika Sutta, the, the Buddha said that if anyone asks you, do the, the Buddhist monks indulge in pleasure? It depends on what pleasure you mean. Sensory pleasures, the five senses, no, but the six sense pleasure, yes, we do. The joys of meditation, the inspirations, which you get if you hear a really beautiful Dhamma talk, if you see great acts of compassion and generosity, oh, they just give you so much inspiration and happiness. Indulge in that, for goodness sake, enjoy it. You know one of the greatest acts, oh just there's quite a few acts of kindness and compassion which I have seen. Some of them just blow me away and I just keep just celebrating and remembering them. In our the nuns monastery we have in Dharmasara nuns monastery. You know that some of the way that these monasteries get built are really inspiring. So we managed to get, uh, this is over in Western Australia, get a nice monastery for the monks. Yeah, what about the women? Oh, let's get a monastery for women. Nuns monastery, Bikuni monastery. So what we did, so what we do, first of all, ask our committee you know, to get that okayed, start a bank account and advertise it. And, of course, nothing's happening. Maybe about $20,000, $30,000 in the building fund. You're not going to get much there, not even a caravan. <laughs> but then, the, the game changer, as they say, was when this guy came along to Bodhinyana Monastery, and he, he came with just a beat-up old car. This was weird. And just sandals, you know, traditional Australian dress. Sandals short and a singlet. <coughs> It's not what you'd expect. And he said, I hear you're building a monastery for women, for nuns. Yeah, as you read it in the, the newsletter. And he said, my wife has just given birth to my first child. It happens to be a daughter. And I want to do something to celebrate her birth. And I'm a Buddhist. And he said, well, I doubt if my daughter would ever want to become a, a nun. You know, it's unlikely, but, you know, who knows. But I want her to have the opportunity. So I want to make a donation. So he handed over a check. I thought maybe $50 or $100. And it was $250,000. And I never saw that guy again. I don't know who he was. It was weird. <laughs> he just came out of nowhere and just disappeared afterwards. But when I think of that, that gives me goosebumps. So, <coughs> well, you know that in the Buddhist tradition, sometimes these this weird things happen, heavenly beings. Sometimes I wonder if that was something strange, supernatural. But it was really weird anyway. But I remember stuff like that. Just, and I love remembering that and talking about it. It's inspirational. That sort of joy, cultivate it. Don't forget it. Don't think, ah, oh, no, no, no. When you cultivate that joy, that gives you inspiration. I've had some of the best meditations when you've heard these great talks, seen some wonderful things happen. You know, just sometimes with a teacher like an Ajahn Chah, sometimes he would, he would drone on for hours and hours and hours. Really boring. Sometimes. And sometimes he hit the spot, the sweet spot. And you listen to it and you just get so inspired. 
really just just beautiful dhamma just really gets you and he's really on so wow and then afterwards you meditate Whoa. you always have great meditations after that because you're you're tying into the happiness which is the cause of meditation this Pasada Kasutra the Buddha said yep we don't attach to the the pleasures of the senses but the pleasures of the mind very much so we indulge in them and he said well if people say, well, what happens if you get attached to the pleasures of meditation and the pleasures of the mind, like inspiration, like compassion, like service? And the Buddha said, well, there's only four possibilities if you get attached to the pleasures of the mind. And those four possibilities are so one, that's the first stage of enlightenment, sakadagami, second stage of enlightenment, anagami, third stage of enlightenment, or fully enlightened. That's only four possibilities if you attach. <laughs> to the pleasures of meditation. <laughs> That's pretty straight down the line saying, well, why not? You know, that was one of the things which really inspired me about this path. It wasn't like, like flogging yourselves or being ascetic or just seeing who can be the toughest. It was a wonderful way of very powerful deep happiness and health. Now that was really cool to see the meditation. You can always tell a person's meditation, not by what they say afterwards, but the is their mouth happy? I'll tell you all my tricks, but you know sometimes retreats people come up to me and they say, Ajahn Brahm, I've had a very good meditation. It was third jhana. And I look at them, say, no way. <laughs> but if they come up and they say, oh, I don't, I don't, oh, I don't, oh, oh, it was, oh, 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 it was, oh, oh, oh so, wonderful, so wonderful, oh. Okay, well done. <laughs> Just the emotional laughter go, really blown out of the universe. A really wonderful happiness. Well, that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, then you get, you get, you get uh, oh yeah, you get attached to meditation, get angry because you don't understand the path of meditation. People do that, they get really nice meditations, they fluke it once or twice <laughs> and then they can't get back there, but at least they have a taste of what it's like and then they realize, oh, go back, why did it happen? What were you doing? And a lot of times, and I mentioned the story of that uh, fellow with the sinus cancer, he gave up, he stopped trying. He said, it's not working. And so he gave up. There's another lady, she's a nun over at Damasara now. She was at a retreat, I shouldn't give up too many clues, but she was at one of my retreats over in Thailand. And nine days, really smart girl and try and try and get nowhere. And then it was, uh, finish the retreat, but her taxi wasn't going to come for another hour to take her to the airport. So she meditated to kill time. That's what she said, killing time. And she was this girl after she came out of meditation. She, I was just having a cup of tea and sitting at a table and she came out. She was on her knees looking up at me. And the, the only thing I'd say is just like a teenager just falling in love for the first time. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it was so cute and so sweet. And the reason was <laughs> because, you know, she'd given up, let go. And of course, a classic tale. I've got to tell you all these lovely stories. This is from the suttas. Uh, Ananda, the Buddha's attendant. I love telling this on meditation retreats, on, on residential retreats, because <laughs> it has these consequences afterwards. I say, Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, listening to the Buddha for 25 years, he was sitting next to the Buddha, uh, hearing all these incredible teachings, having all these people come up and saying, yeah, I've got it, I'm enlightened, and psychic powers, the whole works. And when the Buddha passed away, Ananda was still unenlightened. 
And of course, you can imagine, just that makes you pretty depressed. If we were the greatest teacher in the world and still not enlightened, what hope is there for me? So he got really sort of upset, he'd blown it. So, but then, you know, he was busy arranging everything afterwards, and then uh, the monks decided to have this big meeting together, the first council, to get all the teachings together. So then who can go to this conference, basically, to you know, get all the teachings together? So they chose 499 fully enlightened beings. But they thought, well, let's make an exception. Let's invite this, this um, uh, Ananda fellow, because he was with the Buddha. He'd heard so much, had a very good memory. So they invited him for the conference. And the following day, he had to show up amongst his peers. All of them were fully enlightened. He was the exception, the only one who was not enlightened yet. And at this I usually say, imagine at the end of today, I make the announcement that everyone who's come on this retreat for today is all fully enlightened except you. <laughs> how would that feel? You get some feeling, understanding of how Ananda felt. Oh, he's just really fed up. So what did he do? The night before, he decided to give it everything he got. The old enlightenment or bust idea. He really meditated, didn't sleep, meditated. Everything he knew, everything he'd learned from the feats of the Buddha. He learned everything and he prayed everything, but then when the dawn came, nowhere. No progress at all. So what did he do? He knew the meeting was another hour, so he decided to take a nap. And many of you know that story, that he went to his room and he lay down and just before his head hit the pillow, he became the 500th enlightened monk. And know what he did? He deliberately came in late, because who would believe him? He decided to come in late when all the doors were locked. They'd wait for everybody, he wasn't there, so they locked the doors. And he made what we call the grand entrance. He, he came in through the keyhole. <laughs> now how he did that, you can imagine from, from a Harry Potter movie or a super movie or whatever. I'm not sure, I haven't watched those, but he came in through the keyhole and made this wonderful entrance and they thought, ah, congratulations, another enlightened being. But the most important part was how he became enlightened. He let go, he gave up, he stopped trying. So we call that the Ananda method of enlightenment. It's one of the most popular methods of meditation in my residential retreats, taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> so, I tell you, well, you only do it one, one time a day. You've only got one opportunity to increase the probabilities, you know, after lunch, after breakfast, I don't know. <laughs> But the whole point was, you, sometimes you fluke a deep meditation and then it takes a while, what's going on? Why does this happen? Why when I try, I can't make it happen? And that's where you develop these teachings. But I try to keep this still. I know that being still is so wonderful. I just can't do it and I get frustrated and angry. And I forget, how did that happen in the first place? Because I put things down, I let it go. Never expected anything, didn't know what I was doing. You just put it down because nothing else to do. And then it happens. Perfectly still. The young novice story. Oh, it's Wat Ba Pong in Ajahn Chah's monastery. <coughs> I already mentioned that Ajahn Chah will be... You're very lucky the teachings which you see in those books, they are filtered. In other words, just like when you mine some sort of gold or diamonds, most of the stuff you get out of the ground is actually rubbish stuff. Every now and again you find a nice diamond, which is worth all of the excavation. And honestly, Ajahn Chah, sometimes he would go on and on and on and on and on and on. And I respect him. I was there with him nine years. I think of all the Western monks who was actually with him, I think only Ajahn Pasna was there longer than I was. I think I was number two, although she is spent with him. 
And anyway, she would give long, long talks. But it was worth it, because every now and again, you know, you just have this beautiful nugget of wisdom. But it was worth it for those beautiful nuggets of wisdom. And so, you know, that was uh, uh, really helpful. But it's okay for, you know, for people who go over there because they are, uh, that's, you know, they're interested in becoming a monk. They devote their lives to it. They choose that path. But sometimes it's little novice monks. And they go there as the, the social safety net for, for people whose parents had abandoned them or got killed and too many children. They were looked after by the, the monastery. And they had the same thing in Sri Lanka and Burma. So anyway, this, uh, this little novice was listening to one of these boring talks of Ajahn Chah, which was going on and on and on, and on and on and on. And he said, you know, these big adult monks, you know, they can do this, but I'm a little guy, I'm only 11 or 12, 13 years of age, I need my rest, I don't want to carry on like this. And he started getting very negative, and he started getting this little repeated thought, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is he going to stop? When, and it kept on repeating itself like that until the novice had what we call the insight. A lot of time insight, seeing things from the other way around. So he thought, when am I going to stop? And this little novice stopped. And when he opened his eyes, it was dawn. He hadn't heard all the monks you know, do their chanting and leave. He got into this beautiful meditation for the first time. Little novice, blissed out of his little head. Wonderful time. I don't know for how many hours, enjoying the bliss. Not being able to hear anything or feel anything. First time he got into the deep meditation, really enjoyed it. Because he stopped. Wonderful little teaching there. To stop. I often remember that teaching because that's what was taught to Angulimala. Stop Angulimala. Or rather, Angulimala said, Buddha stops. I've already stopped, you stop. And it's also why, even here in Australia, I see the Dhamma on every crossroads, whenever you see the stop sign. <laughs> I remember that novice. And I remember Angulimala. Stop. <laughs> okay, so I do most of it. Any comments or questions about that? But that's actually what happens. You try, you've had some idea, but you're still wanting. When you want, you can't be still. When you stop, that's how you're still. It's incredible, wonderful meditations. Any questions? Yes, over there. I, I can repeat the question. Don't need to pass the microphone, yes? Okay, when you meditate, sometimes you see colors. Should you pay attention to that color or just, just to uh, ignore it and do something else? It's when you're meditating, it's the seeing the colors in the mind, especially when you get quite peaceful, they're quite helpful. Those colors can actually turn into nimittas, these beautiful lights in the mind. That's when the five senses get very weak. The six senses in the mind. This is the five senses, this is the sixth sense. Usually the five senses are so strong, we have to attend to so much. You know, we're seeing and hearing especially, but physical feelings and uh, smell and taste are also very dominant. In a meditation retreat, we calm down the sides by not <coughs> we do the eight precepts, not wearing ornaments or scents. So we try and calm things down. And closing our eyes, being in a reasonably quiet place, calming those senses down, making the body nice and comfortable, so the f sense of physical touch calms down. As they calm down, a lot of the energy which you, you use in your five senses is now free to go into the mind. The mind starts to get powered. You get stronger, you get more awake after a while. And then the five senses get to be so still, so subdued, that then the five, the sixth sense, the mind, becomes more dominant. 
it appears as a light in the mind. Eventually those five senses, they really get subdued and the energy goes into the mind. It becomes a very bright light, the Nimitta light. And I often say, don't worry, you'll all see that Nimitta light sooner or later. If not, while you're meditating, when you die, you go towards the light. It's the same thing. It's a mind, the way that most people experience the sixth sense, the mind. This mind is Prabhasara, radiant, said the Buddha, when the hindrances are subdued. That's all we experience. So that's where this beautiful light. So if it happens in mind, just let it go. Well, let it go means don't control it. Just sit there like a passenger. This is interesting. Don't get afraid. Don't get excited. Just see what happens. So don't control it. Have fun. Perfectly safe. It's actually really good fun. <laughs>